Thank you for everyone for coming. Just waiting a couple more minutes for everyone to join. Welcome all, welcome all. Perfect, one o'clock sharp. Thank you everyone and hello. Um, thank you for joining us today for our May webinar. Before I introduce our speaker, I would like to go over a few housekeeping notes. Live captions are added and can be turned off on each attendee's screen should you want to. There will be a Q&A session at the end of the presentation. Please be sure to add in your questions in the Q&A section of the Zoom, not the chat. It will be missed in the chat, unfortunately. The re recording of this webinar will be shared two days after the session. However, if you're looking to access sooner, you can find this on our MaxSold Facebook channel. We are excited to be joined by Heather Dawson from Boston, South Carolina. Heather is the owner of Heirloom Appraisals and Dow Sizing Solutions and will be sharing her expertise and knowledge on discovering the hidden value of costume jewelry. Hi, Heather. Hi, thank Hi. you. <laughs> okay, so costume jewelry and discovering the hidden value. Um, I think one of the most important things that I wanted everybody to know, and many of you probably know this if you've been um, in the uh, estate business or the reselling business or just the collector business for a while um, is that, you know, almost every home has a box of costume jewelry, right? Jewelry that nobody really thinks might be worth very much because it's not the diamond rings that are in the safe deposit box or the vault. Uh, so when you come across these boxes, what do you do with them? And I, what I have found is that I rarely come across a box of costume jewelry that doesn't have some significant value somewhere in there, like some gold, some sterling silver, and also some really fun designer pieces that not many people know about. So today we're going to talk a little bit about what to look for and how to find those things. And so first we have a poll and you can take this poll real quick and decide which scenario applies for you. Um, and you can select all of the ones that would apply to you. So I'll give you guys just a moment to do that. Okay. Okay. So the options were which scenario applies? Have you found a box of costume jewelry and donated it all because you thought it was not worth anything? The second option is have you inherited a box of costume jewelry and you're wondering what to do with it? Or the third, you're a collector or reseller of costume jewelry, estate jewelry. So those are the options. Um, moving on to the next slide, uh, just to let you all know that in this webinar, here's what I'm hoping to give you and what you'll gain, strategies, there's a results, excuse me. Um, strategies to find the gold and silver in a box of costume jewelry. A resource list of the most collectible costume jewelry designers from the 20th century. Um, we're gonna talk about several of them. There are a lot, so I'm, I, I can't today get you a list of every single one, but maybe we could work on that sometime. And the third, learning some inspection methods that are used by appraisers. So strategies to find gold and silver in a box of costume jewelry. Hallmarks are the first thing that I would love everybody to know about. Official marks stamped onto gold and silver jewelry in order to attest to their purity. So these are marks that could be numbers, words, stamped onto a piece of jewelry. And we'll talk about where to find them. But these are what tell you that they are pure gold or pure silver. Here's an appraisal tip. First one, getting a jeweler's loop. If you don't have a jeweler's loop, this is an invaluable tool to use when you're investigating and inspecting jewelry. Um, it's a high powered magnifier. You can buy them anywhere on Amazon or eBay, wherever. Um, this is a photo of some of the marks that would indicate a piece of sterling silver. 
So uh, 925 means sterling, 800 means continental silver, which is almost pure, not quite. Um, the word sterling these days you often find on a piece. There's also little pictures and letters that you can look for. And we can talk more about this another time, but um, some of the more relevant ones that you might see are here, the lion. If you see a lion stamped onto a piece of silver, then you know it's sterling, it's English, English sterling. Um, and then with gold, oops, excuse me. With gold, um, we have the same type of scenario. You're going to have, 585, which means it's a 14 karat gold piece, or 750, which would mean it's 18 karat gold. And one of the tricky parts about looking at gold jewelry is where they put those stamps sometimes. And that can be hard for people to see or even know because they're so tiny. And that is where your jeweler's loop will help you because they put them on the post that you put through your ear for your earring and not many people think to look there and not many people could see it without that little loop magnifier. They also put the stamp on the backs of earring backings. Um, and sometimes if you have a, a box of costume jewelry, you might find a handful of little earring backings and several of them might have 14K on it or 18K and that those can add up in scrap value for you um, with rings. It's usually on the inside of the band and sometimes bands can get very worn. And if that's the case, then um, I always advise going then to a jeweler to have the gold tested, which you can always do. There's testing kits, kits out there you can get, but um, you would definitely wanna know how to use that correctly before you do it yourself. And some tips to know about scrap value. So scrap value is the worth of gold, silver, or another precious metal based upon the purity of that metal. Scrap value is determined by weight of only the precious metal without any gems that might be attached. So if you have a piece and there's little tiny stones, diamonds, or rubies, or anything that contributes to weight, but those would be, need to be removed before weighing that metal. Um, the price of scrap gold and silver changes day to day. It's based upon the present economy. It's bought and sold within. And um, pure silver is called sterling silver. Silver plate is a coat of pure silver over metal, generally. Sometimes you can see it over copper or brass, um, which could add some interesting value to it. But for the most part, pure silver is sterling and plated is not. Um, Another appraiser tip. So here is an item to get a little scale to weigh your jewelry and you can get that anywhere, Amazon. Um, and that is how you're gonna calculate your grams or your DWT penny weights. And it'll give you the options for getting those different weights. And the website at the top is a free general website that I like that you can go to and it's an online calculator for you. So. When you weigh all those little pieces of 14 karat gold earring backings and you get your grams, you could go to that website and you can put in um, all your information about the weight and that whether it's gold and it'll calculate how much that is worth for you on that day as far as scrap value goes. So moving on. So we've talked a little bit about gold and silver and how to kind of hunt for those inside a costume jewelry box. Now let's talk a little bit about some of the other fun treasures that you could find in there. And that is your collection of collectible designers. So not all collectible designers made diamonds and rubies in their jewels. Some of them made really fun costume pieces and they made them throughout many eras and many styles. And so we're going to look at that a little bit here. So we have a second poll coming up. And it's a question just about which era might be the most interesting to you when it comes to design or jewelry. So uh, it says, which area is the most interesting to you when it comes to design and or jewelry? And uh, you know, it's multiple choice. Victorian era would be your you know, late mid 1800s to the turn of the 20th century. Um, Art Nouveau. Is that flowery, fluid flowing design, 
which is 1900 to 1920. Art Deco is that you know angular geometric design, 1920 to 1940. Trying to think of like that Great Gatsby type era. Um, Mid-century, that is where those cute and colorful um, jewelry sets come in, the rockabilly style, this is the 40s and the 50s, and then there's Bohemian, your, your mod era, kind of the hippie, the big, bright, you know, flower power, 60s and 70s, and then finally we have the late 20th century contemporary, which is the 80s and the 90s, so um, if you're not familiar with some of these, we're going to talk about them in a moment. But if you are and you have some that are your favorites, we'd love to know what they are. All right. So a lot of interest in the Art Deco, which is a really cool era. Okay. So moving on here. Um, Victorian, late 19th century, early 20th century. Um, I wanted to talk about cameos because this is a big thing that is probably the most common thing that you're going to find in those jewelry boxes that are going to be that old. Um, people don't realize sometimes that cameos can have a significant amount of value depending on their condition and how they're made and, and what they're made from. So a valuable cameo is generally carved from a shell and you can hold it up to the light to a window and see its transparency. It's determined that it's a shell. Um, and it's usually set in a, a gold setting. Some of them are gold plated. Um, some of them are pure gold. And so it's always good to turn it over and inspect. This one is not, but this one is old. It is Victorian, so it has some value for its condition of the shell. Um, but you can look at the little bar on the back of the pin or around the edge of the gold backing to see if there's any stamps there to indicate that it would be gold and use your jeweler's loop to do that. Um, another indicator of older Victorian, early uh, 20th century or late 19th century jewelry could be the clasp. So it's called a C clasp. And it's a little different from what we see today because we have the little locking um, mechanisms on our class that keep it more secure. And back then they just did a simple C clasp that you just hook the pin back into. And whenever you see that, it's usually an indicator that you're looking at a much older piece. Um, Art Nouveau. Um, this is one of my favorites. I love the, the flowing, flowery, scrolling designs. George Jensen's um, was one of the most uh, prominent designers of Art Nouveau. He's Danish. Uh, he lived from 1866 to 1935. His son did take over the company. They do still make pieces today. He has a very signature look and style to his jewelry. And it usually is sterling silver. So if you see something that has this type of look or style in a box of jewelry, it's probably sterling and it very well could be Jensen. I put a picture of what the hallmark on that piece would look like on the back. Art Deco is beautiful. Um, it's a more geometric angular shape to its design. It's moved away from that flowing floral uh, look and style. And this piece has a lot of marcasite in it, which are semi-precious stones that have um, a part pyrite consistency to their makeup. And uh, that was a very popular thing to to just style jewelry with at that point in time in history. And there's some black onyx, which is set on the background of this. This is a brooch. So that's Art Deco. Um, moving into the mid-century. So 1940 to 1960 is really um, an interesting time for costume jewelry. It's when you know the Great Depression is over and the World War II is coming to an end. And um, people did not have the resources to really purchase a lot of very fine jewelry at that point in history. And so what happened is many, many, many uh, artists, jewelry designers started coming out of the woodwork. Many of them emigrated to the States from Europe during that time and started carrying on their skill and their craft in making these beautiful, jewelry sets and 
This to the left is an Alice Cavanis. That's one of the designers. It's called a demi perore, which means part of a full set. Um, they would make full sets that would include, you know, the earrings, the ring, the bracelet, the brooch, the necklace, the um, everything that would match. It's very hard to find a complete set today. So that's why there's only three pieces in this, and it's called a demi perore. Another example of a, of a fun, you know, mid to later 50s demi perore would be, you know, the bright, bold, pop of color. Um, this set probably did have a brooch or, or a ring that may have gone with it at one point in time. This one's by Hobay, another very famous uh, designer name to look for. Here is an example of a full perore. So this is a, actually a, a Christian Dior set, um, and it's got your necklace and your earrings and your ring and your bracelet and your brooch, it's all there. Um, one thing to keep in mind, most of these sets, the, the earrings are usually not pierced. They're usually clip-on backings or those screw-on backings. So moving into the next era, the 60s and the 70s, Trafari is, and many of you have probably heard that name, Trafari is a really well-known jewelry designer. Um, Trafari uh, had started actually in 1925. They really became prominent in the 60s and 70s. They do still make jewelry today. Um, these fun, um, mod modernist looking styles like the enameled elephant, whenever you come across a piece of jewelry and it's smooth and colorful and it has enamel on it, that means that more time and craftsmanship may have gone into it. You want to look on the back to see if it's signed and has a hallmark of a maker name because it very well may. Here's a classic 60s, 70s Trafari style piece. This is called a brushed gold tone metal style because it looks like it's been the gold has been brushed so it's it's a gold tone washed over metal um with these faux glass pearls set in and you can see the trafari signature um, that was found on the back another um vintage 60s 70s very popular designer sarah coventry and sarah um was she started her business in well around 1949 it's still going to the present day as well but the highlight of her era of jewelry was really this 60s and 70s time frame with these very big bold fun modern looking pieces the this is called the reticulated owl pendant and it's it's actually quite large it's probably about three inches long that pendant they're really statement pieces and it's a, a gold tone uh, metal, and you can see her signature, what that looks like there in the bottom, in the bottom photo. So moving into the vintage 80s and 90s, um, we have a few fun designers. Things uh, still kind of stayed bold, definitely got maybe even more colorful. Um, Kirk's Folly is the name of a designer that was really very popular in the 80s and 90s. Um, Kirk's Folly was in business up through 2017, but here's an example of these fun, dangly, colorful earrings. Um, and Kirk's Folly would make these kind of charm necklaces that were really popular in the 90s and late 80s. Um, these are enameled pieces on gold tone metal. Another very popular designer during this time is Laurel Birch, and many people would recognize her cats. Um, she, they're on like fabric prints as well, but they did make several jewelry pieces with her designs, and uh, her signature on the backs are always very clear and very distinct, um, but the cats are what she is known for. She has many different styles of them out there. So looking for those in the box of costume jewelry can always be a fun find. So this is um, a guess which one is worth the most little um, 
game to play just for a moment, just to have a look at these pictures and see which one you think may have been worth the most. Um, and then in the next slide, I will make that reveal. So I'll give you like a couple seconds to look at them and kind of come up with your thoughts. And then I will show you. Okay, so here in the next slide, so this is, this is a piece of jewelry that somebody I know found, a yard sailing, and it, it was a $5 set on the table, and it was uh, purchased for $5, and then uh, turned around, and the person who bought it did sell it, and they were able to get $4,500 for this piece. It's uh, actually not metal or sterling. It turns out it's platinum. And those little stones are not rhinestones, they were diamonds. And the beautiful piece in the middle is a moonstone. So Raymond C. Yard, very famous jewelry designer um, right up into the 60s. So you never know what you can find when you're looking through some of these big tangled messes in a box. And, thinking there might not be anything there. There usually is. Um, so here's some end tips for you all. Uh, oops, sorry, let me go back. So to identify, identifying the valuable jewelry, um, identifying the designer's name and the type of precious metal it's made from, Confirm that the piece is in good condition without any damage or loss. That'll always affect value. If the piece has damage, then you can either have it repaired or maybe you can scrap it. So um, you may have something that is, you know, 14 karat gold and missing its pin back. Um, that is something to consider still getting some value out of. Um, important, if you are unable to confirm the type of stones or metal in a piece of jewelry, then definitely consult a gemologist. They are trained to be able to appraise uh, those types of jewelry, fine jewelry. Um, and if a piece of jewelry has a high-end designer, um, sorry, Hallmark, Tiffany or Cartier, uh, it's very difficult to sell that unless you have an original purchase receipt or an up-to-date appraisal from a gemologist to verify. So always make sure, because there are people out there that create replications and fakes. If you do have a piece with an exciting designer name on the back, just do your homework. Make sure it is what you think it is. Um, and after that, we have a final poll. So we're just interested in, I'm interested to know what type of collector or reseller uh, is attending today. I know there's so many different categories for collecting and reselling, but um, I'm just curious to know what people's passions are out there. So um, I put on here jewelry, fashion, vintage decor. It's one category, cars, Windsor stamps, numismatics, uh, everything mid-century modern, because I know that's been trending for a while rugs, vintage glassware. I put pirates in there with it, but jadeite, Benton, um, tools, toys, like those old Lionel train sets and the matchbox and um, pottery artwork. I'm sure there's more and I wish I could put more in, but just curious to know what you guys really like. All right. And so um, this is me. I'm Heather. I'm an appraiser. I'm an organizer. Um, I'm an auctioneer in the state of South Carolina. Um, went to the Southeastern School of Auctioneering and um, completed the uh, appraisal course with ISA. And uh, I live in Bluffton, South Carolina. So my company is called Heirloom, and feel free to reach out anytime. Here are our, oh, nice. So there's a lot of jewelry, vintage couture people here. Love it. 
And then, okay, yeah, I was wondering about the class. That's cool. Pyrex and Jadeite are fun. Thank you so much, Heather. This was wonderful. Um, and thank you again for sharing your experience and insight with us. We will now go into our Q&A session. If you have any questions, please feel free to type it in the Q&A section at the bottom of your screen. Um, I do have some questions that came in. Um, Heather, I'm gonna start with those. Um, Katie asks, are clip-on earrings more valuable than pierced? I inherited a ton from my grandmother. So yes and no is the answer. So in general, clip-on earrings are much more difficult to sell than pierced earrings. However, if you have a designer name on the back that is very collectible, um, that's going to boost value. Because when we were talking earlier about the demi Peror sets and the Peror sets, you might have you know, a, a pair of earrings signed Kramer or Hobay, and there is a necklace and a bracelet floating out there that they match to. So selling those earrings could be of value to the person that has those other pieces. Yes, thank you so much. Um, there's another question that uh, is from Laura. Why do you need receipt for Tiffany jewelry? That's what she asks. Uh, anytime you have, if you want to sell a piece of jewelry by a very high-end fine jeweler, it's usually best practice, and I know many auction companies will require it, to have authentication. So it's the same with, with art, any type of art. If you have something that's of a more significant value with a very sought after designer name on it, you may need to have some sort of proof of authentication, COA, um, but a receipt could work um, or running it by a gemologist as well. Thank you. Awesome. I think Katie has a follow-up question about those earrings. Um, she asks, should you sell a set together or separately? Together. Yeah. I always advise that. Sounds good. Um, Ruth asks, is there value or collectability of costume jewelry without a hallmark? Sometimes a hallmark or a designer mark can get worn off with age. And if that's the case, perhaps. And also sometimes it could be a piece to a full set. Like let's say Coro created a bracelet, necklace, earrings, and pin. And the bracelet, you know, doesn't have the name on it, but the other pieces do. That can happen sometimes where it's matching a set and the designer didn't put their name on every single piece. That could be a scenario. Thank you. Um, there is also a question from Vanessa. Um, she says, where do you suggest selling jewelry options other than eBay? Oh, yeah. Well, I would say I, I personally have sold jewelry, costume jewelry on the Maxwell platform here, and I've done very well for my, for my clients. Um, so that is always an option. But uh, there's, there's a lot of different ways out there to do that. Um, I mean, antique dealers probably use a variety of different vehicles for selling. Great, awesome. Um, there is another question about where to research European makers, um, Finnish gold necklace. Hmm, the, so this is a specific question about a Finnish necklace. Um, I probably would have to know more about that piece um, to be able to help you with it. And maybe there's a way for you to email a photo later so I can have a look at it and kind of give some advisement. Sorry, I can't do more with that here without seeing it. Thank you. Um, there's another question that just came in again from Ruth. Are there resources to try to identify designers of pieces without hallmarks before going to an appraiser? Um, I mean, there might be online. You can always Google that. Um, you can also go into auction sites like the Max Old one and, and search something and just look at completed sales and see if you find something similar. That's another way to research it. 
Great, awesome. Um, there's another question, it's more specific. Um, when purchasing silver jewelry in Mexico, um, they notice that they don't see any markings telling the purity um, of it. So um, is there any way to test the purity without having to melt it down? Yeah, sometimes they, and, and this happens with some Southwestern jewelry too, they will not have purity marks, especially with old pawn silver. Um, there's really no way to verify without having an expert, like a jeweler, have a look at it. You can say that you do not want it damaged or melted and ask for an expert opinion, but you probably do have to put it in somebody's hands and have them hold it and look at it, inspect it that way. Right, thank you. Um, there is a, another question from Laura. How can you tell if a stone is real or plastic reproduction? So that is a good question. Um, first, if you ever have any question in mind about whether something is real or not, you really, the due diligence is to get it in front of a gemologist. Uh, but um, you can buy a diamond tester. Um, it looks like kind of a big marker type metal thing that you hold and you can put it up against the stone and it'll beep a certain way. You could try that. Um, may probably sell those on Amazon too. Uh, but other than that, um, if it's if it's very cold, it's probably a stone. If the little the stone in it feels cold, if it's not very cold, it's probably a plastic. Um, but really, the best thing to do is to have a gemologist verify anything that you think could actually be a gem. Perfect. Um, someone is asking with regards to your experience with Max Sold. They're saying, what is the best way to sell jewelry on Max Sold? Um, lots or single pieces based on your experience so far? So I do a mix of things. So if I have a client and there's a big box of costume jewelry, I, I go through it like with a fine tooth comb to find anything I can find for them. And then I separate out the gold, I, the silver. And if you put that on the site, I always include what the scrap value comes to and what the weight is so that the buyers know the value of what they're bidding on based on description. Um, if there are, you know, designer pieces that I know really are, you know, more valuable on their own, like some of those names that I had mentioned earlier in the presentation here, I may put them on their own as one lot. I, or I may combine them with another fun set and put those two together as a lot. And then um, anything that is left, I would put as one large costume jewelry lot altogether. Great, thank you for that. Um, someone is asking just general sort of um, feedback on cleaning jewelry and what precautions to make. Uh, you can buy jewelry cleaner. You can buy um, the type of cleaner that you set your rings in or silver polish for silver, and that's fine. I've seen people use just plain baking soda on silver before too, um, without it being watered down. Um, and I guess one thing to keep in mind, and this isn't about cleaning, but for storing jewelry, I recommend always keeping it in a dry place with a cloth. Um, don't ever put anything in plastic and store it. Don't ever put sterling silver in plastic because then you'll get that green vertebrae corrosion. Um, humidity is not the friend of pure metal. So <laughs> Be mindful of that. But as far as cleaning, most of the cleaners that they sell for jewelry out there should be fine. Great, thank you. Um, I wanna ask, what is old pawn silver? So it, it is, um, it's, it's from kind of that time when there was um, trade on, and I'm not an expert on this, let me just clarify that. But from what I understand, there were trading posts in the Southwest um, and you could purchase silver when you were maybe a tourist in the area. And it was a craft and art that was made, um, I believe on reservations. And they sold 
these really fun pieces to tourists coming through. And in, in fact, earlier than that, I believe they would trade them um, for things as well. And, um, but yeah, this whole Southwestern and Native American indigenous, you know, concept of jewelry is fascinating. There's Navajo, there's so many different kinds that would be like a whole nother webinar that would be fun to do and learn more about. And if any of you are experts on that, I would love to hear from you later. Message me. Great, thank you. Um, John asks, it's a very specific question. Um, he asks, a gold buyer uses an X-ray to test purity and type of metals. Does this sound legitimate? Um, I don't know a whole lot about what um, a lot of the gold buyers are doing or what a lot of the jewelers are doing. My recommendation would be to maybe call one or two and compare what they're doing and definitely make sure at least one of them is a reputable jeweler in the community that you're in. Um, because you know, that would be a good way to find out whether or not just one person is doing something different or if it's kind of run at the mill. Um, I know there's testing kits. I haven't heard about the, um, I think, x-ray that you said. That's new to me. Great. Um, there's a question from Facebook. What is the best machine to identify gold and silver? I'm not sure what the best machine would be because I don't know enough about um, the testing, again, I would definitely go to a jeweler or a gemologist and consult with them if you need to test something for purity. Right, awesome. Um, there's a question here that um, sort of pertains to um, your sort of experience on Maxwell, then also I feel like it would pertain to any kind of, you know, online platform. They're asking through Max Sold, they're not able to inspect items and must rely on photos. Any tips for assessing items from photos? Uh, so I, I'm, I'm assuming this question kind of has to do with if you're bidding on something. Yes, as and, a buyer. Yes. Okay. Yeah, definitely make sure that the photos are very clear of marks. So anybody that's selling jewelry that they describe as fine jewelry or designer jewelry, they should include photos of clear hallmarks and purity marks. So you'll want to know that those are there. Um, I, I think that if you ever have an additional question, you should be able to reach out to Max Sold and say, hey, can I just get some clarity from the seller on that too? Awesome, thank you. Um, they are asking, um, Donna asks, does George um, Jensen's son's jewelry sell as well as his father's? Um, sometimes, not always. The original um, Jensen OG is definitely the most collectible, but his son does have a designer following and definitely does hold some value. It may depend on the piece as well, but... Um, Overall, I would say the original is the most expensive, collectible, valuable pieces, but the others are also pretty valuable. Great. Um, Katie asks, can you use those cut and lined boxes that jewelry is usually sold in by department stores? Um, this is for display. Oh, so does she, I wonder if she means for photoing for cataloging. Mm -hmm. If that's the case, then you can, um, as far as photoing jewelry for cataloging, that is definitely a technique that requires practice, but um, you can use whatever really makes the piece pop out. Uh, oftentimes a gray piece of fabric is a great background for jewelry for whatever reason. Gray cloth shows jewelry up really well. Um, but, you know, you can include several photos and one of them, it may be nice to put in the presentation box. As one I think she, she said it's for photoing or storage. So for storage, it should be fine. Just don't put it in plastic or in a humid attic or garage. Great. Um, Sherry asks, I have showcases full of rhinestones and signed pieces, as well as sterling pieces. Would you bulk 
lot, lots by designer, style, subject, or mix it up? I would not mix up designers and styles too much, um, but that could be a personal choice. I would, I would love to see some photos because that would help me help you a little better. But um, really what I do is try to determine value. And then from there, that's how I would decide how to catalog them if you were putting them in an online sale, if that's what you mean. Um, I mean, you could put it some together um, that are the same designer. That could be interesting. But if there are sets, I'd have them stand out on their own. As far as rhinestones, um, just loose rhinestones, uh, you may want to bulk those together. Great. Um, Patricia asks, you can't clean pearls with any cleaner. Is that, can we or can we not? Yeah, I would be careful about pearls because uh, it's not a metal. Uh, it's, it's a culture. So I, yeah, there's probably a specific way to clean pearls. And I suspect you probably can get cleaner just for pearls. But beyond that, I'm not sure how to advise if I have pearls and I'm going to sell the pearls. Um, I don't do anything to them. I sell them as is. And usually photos are very uh, forgiving when it comes to like any sort of tarnish on something. But yeah, you wouldn't want to use a metal cleaner on pearls and probably research what would be a good idea for that. I don't know exactly what to recommend though. Great, thank you. Um, Karen asks, what size magnification jewelry's loop is best to start with? Um, what, well, I don't have mine in front of me. Whatever the one was that we can go back, you could go back and look at the recording of this later and see what that uh, magnification number was on it. I put a photo in one of the slides here of, of an ideal one to get. But if you also just put in jeweler's loop on the site you're buying from, you'll get um, some advisement and description on how well they work for how small of an area you're looking at. Thank you. Um, Donna asked a more of a generalized question. She's asking, how do you know what a price, what to price the pieces at? When you're determining uh, how to value and price pieces, you can go online and research uh, how they've performed in sales in the recent past, uh, or you could consult with an appraiser um, expert in the field that may consult with you to give you some values also. Those are the two main ways I would suggest doing it. Thank you. Um, there is a more specific question here. Um, Vanessa Marie asks, I inherited a set of Henry Winston um, and they appear to possibly be jade beads. He was commissioned to do as an anniversary gift for American Airlines. Um, she's not sure. So she's asking the strand has broken. Does it have enough value because of the designer name? It might. Um, I would advise seeing how much it would cost to get the repair done. Because if the designer for that piece yields a high enough amount, it may be worth getting the repair done. Great. Thank you. Um, Donna has a two-part question. One is how to tell if an item is platinum and, and sorry, palladium, my bad. And the other question is, um, she says, I have tried to acid test um, for that, but do not understand what she's looking for. Um, she says, do you have any suggestions with regards to that? Yeah, I actually don't know a whole lot about the palladium and testing. I personally don't do any testing ever. Um, I always defer testing to a jeweler because I don't know enough about it and I've never been trained in how to test it. I just look for marks um, and hallmarks and designer names and use those as the indicators from there. And then if there's something that I feel needs to be authenticated, I would go to the jeweler and do that. And if I ever come across something that I feel needs to be tested, I don't do that personally. I would go to an expert that does. So I'm sorry that I don't know more about the, the testing part. 
or the palladium. Thank you. Um, there's another question. There's a lot, there are a lot of questions, Heather. Everyone wants to know. <laughs> um, there is another question from Laura. Is there any value to freshwater pearl jewelry? There can be. I would say that look at how it is strung. So with pearls, when you have everything knotted in between, um, usually there is more value to that. There's more time that's gone into the craftsmanship and it may be a clue that it's associated with a sought after designer. Um, and that being said, with the freshwater pearls, I would look to see who the designer is if you can. And look at the clasp on pieces. If, if you could determine that there's a gold or a sterling silver clasp, then there's probably a little more value and it probably is associated with a designer. Great, thank you. Um, there is another question. Um, I, if I butcher this, I apologize. Um, Heather asks, another Heather asks, um, what is the scoop on scarabs? Did I say that oh, right? Scarabs, yeah, the Egyptian stones and they have them like in carnelian and all these different pretty bright color stones. Yeah, th I, there's a lot of that in the market right now because it was a very popular style that was worn um, many decades ago. And so you're going to find those, yes, often in boxes of costume jewelry. I would look at what they're set in because if they are set in gold, um, then they probably are going to hold more value. They also have made ones that are just fun costume style link bracelets. So looking at the, the, the metal base that they're in is going to be a helpful indicator in determining value on those. Perfect. Um, again, another follow-up is, is pawn silver always marked? It is not, it is not. So that's, that's one of the, the tricky things about it is, it can maybe have the name of the designer on it um, and not have any indication that it's a pure silver. Great. Um, there is another fun question here um, from Ellie. What's the most exciting story you have related to your appraisals and jewelry sales? Um, oh boy, fun stories. Oh, there was a client several years ago that um, I was helping and uh, he found, well, he was taking a box of jewelry to a thrift store that he figured was just, you know, stuff his mom had gotten at yard sales because she liked to yard sale. And the team that was working with him um, to catalog a sale asked him to wait and, um, you know, said, you never know, there might be value in it. And it turned out there was a pair of 1940s Cartier cufflinks that sold for, I don't, I don't remember, it was many years ago, um, but it was probably between 30 and 40,000 <laughs> that it sold for. And he, I mean, that's the kind of the fun part of it. You never know what you're going to find. And, you know, he was blown away. I don't, he said, my mom didn't even know this. She just found them. She thought they were cool, you know? So people don't, they don't always know what they have and put it out for sale at a community yard sale. And then it ends up somewhere in somebody's hands and they have a big surprise. Great. Um, there is another question from Karen. Does the term costume jewelry have any particular meaning? Yeah, I think that term really evolved in the mid 20th century, post-World War II, when there was that breakaway from, you know, fine jewelry was what you bought and gave as a gift. If you were getting jewelry, then it was gold, it was fine. And what happened was we had, a, you know, we ended up having a strong middle class that did not necessarily have the means to purchase something at you know, Tiffany and company or such, but they still wanted to be in the buyer market and buying beautiful jewelry. So 
all these designers started coming out of the woodwork to create these beautiful sets that were essentially costume, not fine. And I believe that would be where that kind of kicked off. Great, that sounds really interesting. Thank you, Heather. If you um, have the, the term estate jewelry, maybe this helps clarify. Estate jewelry can be either or. Um, if somebody says, oh, we have some estate jewelry we're selling, then it's probably, they know it's already a mix of fine and maybe some costume. Costume is generally just that, that art of costume jewelry. Thank you. Um, there is, there were also some questions from before. I'll just bring them up now. If you have any other questions, please feel free to post, post it in the Q&A section. Um, there was a question from before, Heather. Um, what is it meant when a description says we design jewelry? Oh, it says we des we design jewelry, meaning they're Re saying redesigned. Oh, redesigned. Redesign. Yes. Oh, I believe that they're talking about repurposing. I think that's my guess. If somebody says it's a redesigned piece, then you know, and that is a fun craft that many people are doing now. They're taking old costume jewelries and repurposing them, redesigning them into a collaborative necklace or bracelet that includes many different beautiful pieces and components from other sets of jewelry. I think it's like a repurposing. Great. Um, there's another question. Um, when setting a price for gold jewelry, do you have to keep current with the daily gold price or is that irrelevant for antique and older pieces? No, you have to keep current with the gold price. Um, I put a link in this webinar for the online calculator that's free that you can use once you weigh, weigh it. Thank you. I do have a comment, more of a comment, not a question. Martha says, thank you so much. This is the best hour I've spent in a long while. So <laughs> thank, thank you. Martha. So um, I'm just going to give a couple more minutes for any other questions that there might be. Um, as everyone can see, um, Heather's website is on the screen, heirloomdownsizing.com. If you have any questions or any suggestions, definitely you can visit that website. Um, if there aren't any questions, we can probably wrap up a little bit earlier, unless Heather, you have anything you wanted to share, any closing thoughts? Um, no, not at all. And if anybody feels that they want to reach out and send me a photo of something they want more clarity on, I'm happy. I'm happy to help. You could message me on the Facebook too, probably. Yes. Um, there is one last question. Um, again, I am not an expert, so I might butcher this name. Um, what is the value of, is it Rices or is it Rices pieces? Or R-I-S-I-S pieces? I'm not sure. I, I, can, I can look into that. Maybe somebody can reach out later with that question and I'll see sure. what I can find out. Yeah, um, it's Victoria. So Victoria, if you wanna reach out to Heather, at heirloomdownsizing.com, or you can also reach out to us at customer success um, at maxold.com um, if you have any questions. I'm sorry if we weren't able to understand the question. Um, okay, so I will, oh, there is another question from Susan Houston. Where would I get value and sell? Um, oh, I don't know if this is gonna, it's more of a generalized question, not really about, um, jewelry, but it's, um, it's about antique dolls. Where would I get value and sell an antique doll? Hmm. That probably will have to be a whole nother webinar <laughs> that I don't know that I can run because I'm not a doll expert. Um, but that, that is a question that I will give some thought and, you know, potentially there are people here that are doll experts that are tuning in today that may be can reach out with some ideas. I'm not a doll expert as far as valuing dolls. Um, and you're looking for an appraiser, I presume. I do know uh, people that appraise dolls that I could connect somebody to if that's what you needed. Right, one last question, I think, um, from what I see. Um, Judy asks, I found a Susan B. Anthony gold dollar with a P by the collar. Um, 
Some places online say it's worth $3, some say it's 30, some say it's 30,000. How can I find the value and the true value actually? Mm. So, and coins is another thing, um, which would be another awesome webinar. A numismatist is who you need to talk to. And I sadly am not a numismatist. Um, N-U-S-M-A-T-I-S-T. Numismatist is the name of coin appraisers. And they are your experts because there are so many small intricacies that have to do with coins that you really need to talk to somebody who's a specialist in that appraisal field. Um, most jewelers know numismatists or are them as well. Um, I mean, I know that imperfections on a coin can increase value. But there's just, there's so many variables involved that you do need to consult with somebody who specializes in that. Great. Two more questions, Heather. <laughs> um, Vanessa Marie asks, I have uh, come across a, a lot of hat pins that are, um, uh, she's asking basically, are there any specific designer styles or markings to look out for with regards to those? Look along that long pin bar, you know, that the sticky part <laughs> and see if there's any hallmarks on there. That's where you're going to find the 14K or the 18K or the 10K or anything that indicates purity of metal. Um, and then also on there is where you probably find a designer name. So if it has a designer name, yes, it may have some value. It depends on who that designer is. And if you do have ones that are much older and you might see something stamped into it that says PAT and then a series of numbers that could indicate that it's quite old as well. That's like a patent pending um, stamp mark that can indicate older pieces. So I would say purity of metal, designer and age is the factor with hat pins and condition, of course. Thank you. Um, our other Heather <laughs> asks, what about individual gemstones? What are your thoughts on those? They have to get in front of a gemologist. Um, I mean, any appraiser that says that they can tell you what a gemstone is worth needs to have some sort of GIA credential because those are tricky and um, really they need to be authenticated. Perfect, thank you. Um, we have only a few more minutes. Um, if there aren't any other questions for, um, I don't see any on our end, um, I will go into sort of my closing. Um, if there, yes, I don't think there are any questions. So um, thank you so much, Heather, um, for putting this presentation together. And um, thank you all for attending and asking questions. To those who registered, um, uh, through our Zoom link, we will be sending out a recap email that includes some key takeaways from the webinar on a one-page document. Uh, thanks again for joining, and this concludes today's webinar. Have a wonderful day. Um, thank you so much, Heather. Bye. Thank you. Bye, guys.